Crisis is a piece of computer software. It is the purest, most boiled down and I think objectively true statement one can make about undoubtedly one of the finest looking pieces of interactive entertainment that's ever been created. I missed the boat on Crisis the first time around. I was 17 and purely from financial necessity, perfectly happy with the computing power of my Xbox 360 and its ability to render Bioshock at a playable level, to really worry myself too much with what was happening in the realms of PC gaming at the time. It was only after I built my own computer in 2012-13 to that I first played Crisis, using the software as a benchmark to measure the power of the machine I had assembled. Even six years after its initial release and running it with the irresistible combination of a 3500K and a HD7850 with 2GB of DDR5 no less, I was unable to run the game on its highest settings. I swallowed the initial disappointment, tweaked a few settings and carried on. When I came back to the game to make this video I performed the same steps. New computer, new hardware, new tests of my choices as a system builder. No such disappointment this time. A 9700K, 980Ti and a high refresh rate panel finally allowed me to pass that barrier beyond which I failed to pass in 2013. Playing Crisis back then, even with the technical limitations of my machine, was a revelation technologically speaking. Playing it today, 12 years later, well the software still blows me away, even more profoundly than say The Witcher 3's game world or even Red Dead Redemption's. Both of those worlds might be deeper mechanically speaking, feeling to me similar to a painting that you can reach through and rearrange as you see fit, but they are paintings with different artistic styles to Crisis. Temeria and New Austin are impressionist, giving, well, the impression of a realistic world, the sights, the sounds, without worrying too much about the actual physical possibility of their landscapes. Crisis? Crisis is realistic, a simulation of the world that tacks as close to the world outside your window as was technologically possible to create. The wind tussles the trees, frogs hop around in the shallow brooks and pools that punctuate the beaches of the island, exotic bird life wheels and swoops over the bullet-ridden corpses of your erstwhile enemies. I thought I had properly encountered the software in 2013, but genuinely several moments playing it in 2019, I had to double take and make sure I wasn't just looking through a window in my room to somewhere else on earth, perhaps through the high definition camera of a drone hovering over some piece of particularly attractive foliage in the Pacific. The cool hush of wind through the branches, the sudden silence of a natural wilderness reclaiming the landscape after the shouting and gunfire, of the most recent skirmish prompted by my nanosuit running out of cloaking power at an inopportune moment. My monitor was probably the single most instrumental piece of hardware facilitating this feeling in me, the high refresh rate imitating the mechanics of actual vision better than any 60Hz panel ever could. And it was this realisation that really crystallised something that should really have been obvious to me since first booting the game in 2013. I referred to it in the first line of this video. Crisis is experienced principally at least, and I think almost exclusively at most, as software, a computer program that is particularly good at crunching together a really quite breathtaking volume of numbers to conjure the images on the screen before us. I'm not alone here. Going back to the reviews released at the time, almost without fail the first couple of sentences will refer or invoke the spectre of the computational power that is required to bring the game into being. For IGN, Crisis is stunningly beautiful. Eurogamer exclaims, of course, because that's how things are supposed to look. PC World 2 describes the game as a simulation. Crisis assaults the eyes, and then the ears, and then the eyes again, and then the ears again. Mechanical stimulation comes way, way later, it's five minutes between stepping into the nanosuit of the player character Nomad and killing your first enemy, and at that point you have been introduced to pretty much every mechanical trick that Crisis will throw at you, beyond some vehicle controls and zero gravity navigation. The halo jump at the beginning pulls double duty as both a technological as well as narrative reveal, in the tradition of some of the best open world games of the time. The introduction of the island in Far Cry, the capital wasteland in Fallout 3, Rapture in Bioshock, all of these moments show off the technical achievements of their respective pieces of software, while at the same time teasing the player, showing them what they have to look forward to in the hours ahead. The Halo jump is a restaging of Far Cry's reveal as you emerge from the broken down bunker blinking in the sunlight. A lot of Crisis, in fact, is a restaging of Far Cry 3 years previous, a soft reboot if you will, but while Crisis is infinitely more technically impressive, the effect of Far Cry on the gaming landscape at the time remains undiminished. 
Much like Crisis, almost any critical reaction to Far Cry from the major gaming publications of the time you care to name responded principally in terms of its role as a piece of software. GameSpot calls Far Cry a stunning technical achievement, IGN introduced their review by framing the game as a stress test for any modern machine. The first sentence of Eurogamer's article is looks aren't everything, the word but hovering menacingly over the end of that sentence. It is in fact this last from Eurogamer that is key to understanding Crisis as a piece of software, because the looks indeed aren't everything. It was not enough for Crytek to polish the graphical computations of CryEngine 2, dust their hands and shift to arguing whose round it was first down the pub. I mentioned earlier how the combination of computational power and a high refresh rate monitor gave me pause at a particular moment of stillness, and I ceased to see the mediating presence of the game engine in rendering the stunningly pretty jungle I saw on the monitor before me. I in fact ceased to see the monitor at all, for a moment, just a moment, I was looking through a perfectly clear lens into another world. My desk, the boats chugging gently past my window, the admittedly quite loud hum of the fans in my computer struggling to keep my system from overheating. It all faded away and I was there, standing in the dust, scores of enemy bodies at my feet. As a gamer, it was an incredible moment, but as a developer, well, the moment where your multi-million dollar game engine becomes transparent, becomes merely part of the furniture of the game world that you are creating, is the moment you have reached the point of diminishing returns. As a developer of CryEngine 2, any given moment needs to be reminding the player of how technically impressive it is and how technologically demanding it was to create. Remember the opening words of the major gaming publications' reviews of Crisis at the time? Well, it is those words that Crytek were chasing the whole time during the development of Crisis. Crisis is a piece of software, true, but it's also an advert. An advert that is showing off one thing at any point in the game that you care to choose. And that one thing is CryEngine 2. Prey, Kingdom Come Deliverance, the Far Cry games, all use CryEngine, a form of it at least, and all emphasise large, open or at least interconnected environments, a self-contained ecosystem, a sandbox for the player to splash about in in pretty much any way that they see fit. If you can see it, you can probably pick it up, or walk there, or shoot it. It's a freedom the engine is designed to facilitate, but its ubiquitousness in these types of games would not be so if it were not for Crisis and the open world that it provides the player to run around in. It is, for all that, a pretty mechanically barren place to be. The undergrowth may be beautifully lush and a blood-red sun reflects in the lazily lapping waves on golden beaches, but purely in gameplay terms, Crisis is one note in terms of what players actually do as they either sneak or tramp or a combination of both, their way through the jungle, up into the mountains and down through the wide valley on the other side. Everything, from the narrative through to the mechanical options open to the player at any given second, is designed to promote the styles of play that emphasise the graphical and physical fidelity of CryEngine 2. Crisis offers just enough, no more, for fear that greater mechanical complexity would distract from what is actually important in terms of what the game is trying to do. Crisis works best as a game and as a piece of technology during its opening hours when the environments are as open as they will ever be and the opportunities for creative exploration and dynamic combat encounters are at their peak. It's an incredible moment after you work your way off of the beach through the relatively speaking narrow, cliffed-in environments where you meet Jester and discover Aztec's body, up to an overlook above a KPA outpost. The map opens up completely, not dissimilar to the curtain rising at the beginning of a play. It is a broadening of the scope of the gameplay as well as the environment, explicitly linking the two. The wider and larger the environment in Crisis, the greater gameplay opportunities open to the player. Prophet tells Nomad to tag enemies with his binoculars, drawing attention to the game's preference for the player actually using the exquisitely rendered and designed environments to their advantage. Almost without exception, Crisis gives the player elevated positions from which they can plot their method of attack. Whether they choose to utilise this tactical consideration is another question, but the rolling foothills of the island practically force these opportunities on the player regardless of their playstyle. Combat at distance is Crisis's preferred mode of engagement, and stealthy play is the primary mode as gently suggested to the player through the game's level design. It is simply easier, and definitely more satisfying, to pick off unassuming guards from a distance, quietly, as they amble around the dusty tin roof shacks of their beachside outposts, before moving closer to eliminate any stragglers. The arsenal certainly favours long-range weapons, assault rifles and sniper rifles, complete with an array of scopes and laser sights. 
Shotguns and SMGs come later as the gameplay moves towards more built up environments, but ammunition is scarce and you'll more often than not find yourself switching back to your assault weapon for 95% of combat encounters. The size of these early game environments, combined with the gameplay loop and choice of weapons that are subtly pushed on the player, work to show off CryEngine 2 at its best in every way you care to imagine. From the visuals themselves to the physics engine, the daylight cycle, particle systems to the AI, Crisis centres its prowess as a piece of software, sidelining the player in their own game. The long range nature of 90% of most of the gunplay draws attention to the remarkable sophistication of the game's AI, which reacts to the player depending on their play choice in breathtakingly realistic ways. They work in pairs, calling out to each other, intelligently using cover and flanking tactics to ensure that the player is constantly moving, utilising the game's environment to their advantage. Enemies will search areas where your last gunshots rang out from, allowing you to move positions and take them unawares. They almost always move in pairs, however, which itself forces the player to adapt to ever-changing circumstances. And all of this while crouching and pushing gently through the lush vegetation, the sun slowly going down behind a distant range of mountains, blood red and brilliant orange clashing and weaving in the evening sunlight. The pacing of these encounters allows breathing room for the player, time to plan the next move, but also time to appreciate the sheer impressiveness of the computational power that brings the lush jungle to life. AI and player circle around each other in this way, the dynamics of any combat encounter in turn pushing the player into utilising the most sophisticated tool at their disposal to emerge victorious, their nano suit. It is fitting that a game that frames itself more as a piece of software than mechanical experience should find a way of mediating that experience through something that is itself a software-hardware hybrid. The player doesn't technically see the world through the eyes of Nomad, it is the world as represented through the heads-up display of Nomad's nano suit. The first-person shooter tropes of map, weapon and mission information displayed on screen are given an in-game explanation. Mechanically and narratively, the player and Nomad respectively are completely at the mercy of the hardware they find themselves trapped within. It is at once their greatest asset and also their greatest weakness. Mechanically, the nano suit offers a variety of abilities that augment the combat and exploration opportunities open to the player. A cloaking system allows the player to go unseen, strength mode allows them to jump great distances, shield mode boosts the amount of damage they can take, and speed mode allows them to traverse great distances in a short period of time. Shifting from one to another is mechanically smooth and reinforces the feeling of power for the player, while simultaneously reducing any possibility for a break in the flow of exploration or combat that might distract from the beauty and sophistication of CryEngine 2. These abilities are not infinite, however, and a power bar depletes over time which limits how long any of these particular abilities can be used. At a number of narrative points, the nano suit is rendered temporarily useless, however, moments of comparative weakness that, albeit briefly, highlight how weak and vulnerable Nomad's human frame is. At two moments, the ultimate power the suit has over the human inside is revealed in very stark terms. Your dead comrades are vaporised to prevent their nano suits from falling into enemy hands. The reliance of the flesh on the machine is underlined, obliquely referring to the way that the player is mechanically reliant on the suit and, by extension, the way that the player is reliant on the software of Crisis itself for the entertainment they are consuming. It is a narrative hook that Crisis very definitely refuses to engage with. A science fiction title would surely feast on this theme and dissect it for all that it was worth. A science fiction title would also surely not have access to the budget and resources that Crisis has. A science fiction title with its emphasis on narrative, story and themes would not have nearly as much access to such sophisticated software as CryEngine 2 offers. Crisis is more of an action-adventure swashbuckler than anything else, centering the software and mechanics that themselves centre the software to the exclusion of all else. Narratively speaking, the game is pretty barren, the bare-bones three-act structure, introduction to the characters, the island, the gameplay loop, escalation upon entering the mountain and discovering the hidden alien structure, and a subversion of the gameplay mechanics that have become so familiar in the previous hours, and then acceleration to the end, the action getting faster paced to match the increased rate of exploration and movement. The KPA soldiers are evil because they are foreign, the aliens are evil because they are even more foreign than the KPA, the Americans are the good guys because, well... The final crescendo is a big boss battle because of course it is, and then the game ends. The frenetic, out of control feel of the third act is just as well because, frankly, Crisis runs out of ideas after the first act and certainly ceases to play to its strengths after you enter the mountain. 
The mountain forms the geographical and narrative centre of crisis. It comes at a moment in the narrative where genuine peril needs to be introduced, and a moment in gameplay where the systems and tactics with which the player has become perhaps too comfortable are upended. This is literally the truth a short distance inside the alien structure itself, when the gravity is turned off for, let me check my notes here, no reason whatsoever. A short period of exploration of the new environment allows the player to get used to the new controls and, more crucially, admire the new visuals and other graphical and physical delights that CryEngine 2 is throwing up at them. The alien structure is frustrating because for all of its impressiveness it is giving away no clues as to how to progress. It is a narrowing of the opportunities open to the player, both tactically and spatially, one that will run down to the rest of the game, but good god, even playing through this area for the second time, I swear the only reason I came out the other side was more luck than any competent play on my part. This goes for the combat encounters as well. You enter the alien structure with the weapons on your back, and you'd better hope that you are economical with your ammo. You won't pick up any in your long trek through the mountain, and if you don't adapt to the movement mechanics quite as quickly as you'd like, well, I hope you like melee combat. Or flying around aimlessly waiting for a set of not very obvious beams of light to finally connect up or something. This section of the game significantly reduces the scope for exploration by reducing the scale of its environment and style of level design, and negates any desire to even entertain the idea of exploring by making the visual design samey and frustrating to engage with. The alien enemies fly around, some rush at you, some flit about at a distance shooting you with lasers, but the lack of cover options and style of competence you face completely change the style of the combat, and not for the better. Narratively and mechanically, Crisis needed to develop at the point that the player enters the mountain. Instead, it resets, again mechanically and thematically. Breathe a sigh of relief as you return to the comforting familiarity of the island's lush jungles, but be prepared to take that breath back. The pace goes from 0 to 100 quickly here, not so much gently ramping up to a satisfying crescendo in line with narrative and gameplay developments, as dumping a rock on the accelerator pedal and holding on for dear life. Nomad's sojourn through the alien I'm going to guess spaceship has activated it, prompting an alien invasion. The island is frozen and the aliens pour from the mountain to wreak havoc on the landscape beyond. You fight these aliens for the rest of the game, and the same problems that they cause for the gameplay in the mountain are solidified once you escape. In fact, they may be made even worse. Inside the mountain, free of gravity, the player at least fought on the same, ahem, level playing ground as their enemy, obeying the same rules. They could fly around just as dynamically, changing direction, using height and distance to prevail. Shackled to the surly bonds of Earth by gravity, they are restricted to the same mechanics and tactics as they were fighting the other human enemies, but again without facing an enemy with a set of AI that works to the game's strengths. The enemies fly around, always towards you. Cover and clever tactical movement and mastery of the terrain is no longer rewarded. Either move or die. You are given alien weaponry with infinite ammo but a cooldown period. I used it a few times but threw it away. I liked the gameplay Crisis gave me in the first few hours. I wasn't too prepared to completely throw it by the wayside. Crisis narrows once the player leaves the mountain. The valleys grow steeper and narrower, the player is chained to a vehicle for almost all of it. The final hour of the game is straight up running down corridors to throw switches at the behest of some guy you've never met before, and I thought I was the one wearing the all-powerful nano suit here. From the early hours when you are pretty much at leisure to play the game how you damn well please, the last hours are narrow enough that you could legitimately call Crisis a rail shooter for the overall percentage of playtime you spend being told where to go and what to do. Crisis needed to resolve itself, and it falls back on the time on a three-act structure in order to provide closure. Narratively, it succeeds, I guess, though only in the strictest and most generous use of the term. Mechanically, Crisis frontloads all of its strengths and arguable innovations, but struggles and ultimately fails to maintain the incredible momentum it built up for the first third of its runtime. It's interesting to look at the three-act structure Crisis adopts beyond its usual application to narrative and apply that framework to understand how Crisis presents itself to the world as a technological achievement as a piece of software. The first act shows CryEngine's prowess in physically rendering gorgeous 3D environments, amazing particle effects, day-night cycles, dynamic light, along with more specified modelling such as bullet drop experience with fighting at a distance. 
The second act shows that the engine can handle colours other than verdant green and doubles down on the technical excellence that it can achieve. The final act shows that it can handle vehicle sections too, the brief and entirely optional vehicular exploration available in the first act of the game notwithstanding, as well as, yes, indoor sequences for those developers worried about purchasing the licence for an engine that is being shown off in a game, with perhaps too great a reliance on outdoor environments. It is a checklist, a shopping list if you will. You want reflections in your game? CryEngine 2 has got you covered. Nigh on photorealism in your cutscenes? Big red tick. Realistic vehicle physics? You've come to the right place. Crisis is a consumer product most definitely, but its audience are the consumers of industry grade software and technology. You and I, gamers, were secondary targets for what Crisis was trying to do. Arcane, Bethesda, Warhorse, these are the people that Crisis was made for and a really interesting example of how an audience fundamentally changes the style and ultimately content of any product, any product at all, that is created for human consumption. Thanks for watching.